to have him close to him? Who, Joseph? Yeah. No, he's testing the other brothers is what he's doing. He's seeing if they have changed their heart from the time they, oh, did, to, they did to him. To him. Right. That's what's going on. All he wants to know is, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to reveal myself to these guys unless I know that they are trustworthy people. There's just no way. Or if I do reveal myself to them, it's going to be in a way that they are not going to like. Just imagine, you know, when Jesus comes and he reveals himself in the fullness to the people of Israel, are they going to accept him? Well, we already know that they will based on Zechariah. It says they'll, each one will mourn for him as they mourn for their own family. They're going to be in agony over the fact that they had rejected Jesus for all these thousands of years. And it's a picture. This is a picture of what's coming when Jesus returns to the people of Israel. Another perfect example, if you look at the patterns of parallels, as to why the church has not replaced Israel. And we know with 100% certainty that the tribulation is directed not to the church, but to the people of Israel. To get them to understand who their Messiah was and that the church was simply an insert in God's economy until the time that the kingdom is going to be restored. Okay? All perfectly fits it if you look at the parallel. But here we go. We're, we're going to see what he's going to do. But Judah is going to save the day. Go ahead. Judah approached him and said, Sir, please let your servant speak personally to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, My Lord, we have an elderly father and a young brother, the child of his old age. The boy's brother is dead. He is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him to me so that I can see him. But we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If we were to leave, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, If your younger brother does not come down with you, you will not see me again. This is what happened when we went back to your servant, my father. We reported your words to him, but our father said, Go again and buy us some food. We told him, We cannot go down unless our younger brother goes with us. But if our younger brother isn't with us, we cannot see the man. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One left, I said, that he must have been torn to pieces and have never seen him again. If you also take this one from me, and anything happens to him, you will bring my gray hairs down to Sheol and sorrow. So, if I come to your servant, my father and the boy is not with us, his life is wrapped up with the boy's life. When he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. Then your servants will have brought the gray hairs of your servant, our father, down to Sheol and sorrow. Your servant became accountable to my father for the boy, saying, if I do not return him to you, I will always bear the guilt for sinning against you, my father. Now, when you hear the term your servant, he's speaking about himself. Okay? Just so you know. I know it's kind of a hard terminology, but he says your servant, your servant. He is speaking to a superior. And so, rather than saying me, he's saying your servant. I, I, I am at your disposal. No, no. He's talking about himself here. He, he's speaking. It start up right at... Um, uh, 18, he says, uh, Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh Lord, uh, my Lord, please let your servant sure. speak. And so he is saying, I am your servant. I, he's trying to set up the contrast between him and his brother. And he's explaining what happened with Joseph, which is, isn't totally true. But at the same time, you know, how do you go back and say, We killed our brother? You know what I mean? So, or we sold our brother as a slave or whatever. So he, he kind of just fills in the details in, a, in kind of a sketchy manner. But he keeps saying, your servant, your servant. I want to replace my brother in this incident. Please don't let my father go through the agony that he went through once already. That's what he's doing. So take me in his place. And we're going to see that in the next verse you read. Okay. Now, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. Let him go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father without the boy? I could not bear to see the grief that would overwhelm my father. Okay, so now, they have come down and they have seen their, uh, their Lord. Okay, even though he's a brother, their Lord. They saw him on the first visit. They came back. They saw him again. They started to depart. And then they were called back. So this is like the third time that they are 
in his presence or understanding his ministry. Okay? And now we're going to see Joseph reveal himself to him. And if you think about the parallel, Jesus came and manifested himself to Israel 2,000 years ago. Okay? And then there's going to be a short duration of him manifesting himself to Israel again. Right now we have the Messianic Judea Jewish movement, which is taking off, and they are starting to say, he is our Messiah. This hasn't happened other than a pocket of Jewish person around the world over 2,000 years. We've got this congregation of people that believe in Jesus. Okay? And there's, I don't know how many in Israel, but there aren't a lot, but around the world we'll say, say 100,000 Jews. I have no idea what the number is. But it's a small number, and when the rapture happens, they will, there'll be no excuse for them not to recognize who he is. Second visit. And then the third visit, Jesus is going to come back literally and physically to Israel. And that is when they are going to recognize him. So you see the parallel. This is the third visit, or actually it, it, it's like one visit, a short little visit, and then a third actual visit. Okay, And that's exactly what happens with the brothers going down there. So the parallel of the way that Jesus is showing himself to the people of Israel is almost identical to the way that Joseph is presented to them. They just can't recognize him. And he is actually going to have to come and say, I am your brother. Okay, same thing as Jesus coming on this white horse, King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's not going to be written in Greek and it's not going to be written in English. It's going to be written in Hebrew. And it's going to be written on... People say, oh, he's got a tattoo. All right. It's not it at all. Well, you know what I'm saying. It says it's written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, that's not it. That, um, it you're out at the, uh, the beach ceremony. If you come out to the beach, you'll see every time I'm out there... When I do the Lord's Supper, we do the Lord's Supper every single week. I put on a talit. It's a, a prayer shawl. I should bring it in. Did I bring it today? No. It's, it's a white prayer shawl. And hanging at the end of it is what's called a tzitzit. It's a little thing about this long. Hangs off. If you see Jewish people walking around, they'll have these strings hanging out of their pants or something. For years and years, they were forbidden to have their Jewish garments seen in public. So what they would do is they put them under their clothes and then they'd have this tzitzit hanging out. It just became their only identifier of their Jewishness. Okay? Well, this tzitzit is woven in a certain way to show family identity. Okay? This is what they used to use back in that time. Is they'd take this, this old tzitzit and every family had their own knot, their own way of doing it. And so if they had a, a uh, piece of clay, for example, they would press that knot into it and that would be their signature. Okay, this is the way they would identify themselves. And so you would know what family and clan they were from by the way that it was woven on this tzitzit. Okay, when it says that, um, we're going to divert just for a second to Malachi, I think it's chapter 4. Oh, here they are in my head. Um, Malachi chapter 4, I think is where we want to go to. Last, last book of the uh, Old Testament, right before Matthew. And it says, um, uh, Let's see here. Yes, it says 4-2, uh, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Okay? What that's speaking of is the wings of the talit, this prayer shawl. It looks like you're wearing, it, it looks like you have wings almost. The healing in the wings is the tzitzit. It's the symbol of authority. So what did the woman do that was, had a, a, uh, she was bleeding for 12 years. She was considered unclean. That's right. And she, she touched the hem of his garment. Well, she touched the tzitzit. That is the symbol of his authority. And she knew that. So when she went up and she touched that, she was saying, I am going to receive his authority. You don't get that in the Greek. And you, unless you know the Hebrew custom, you'd never understand why would she touch the hem of his garment. She's touching the symbol of his authority. His seat seat. It, it's woven with the family yeah. registry. So what? So that's what, uh, <laughs> what was that, Dave? Well, so that, that's why when the Lord commended her for her great faith. That's right. He, uh, she understood who he was in the authority. That's right. His authority. Seat seat. And that, that is on the garment. And I'll try to remember to bring it next week. I always take all the stuff out of the bag from the church. But the talit is the garment. The seat seat is the little thing. So a talit is just a big square thing. And then at the end, you've got these little things. And then mine's real fancy. It's got all this stuff hanging all over the place. It's got blue stripes here. And it's got Hebrew written up here. Anyway. And then you just take it and you wrap it around yourself. And so anyway, that, that's what that is talking about. Um, there is a belief, if you know the, uh, the account in Acts where Peter has a dream 
and uh, three times a sheet is brought down to earth and it's full of all kinds of uh, unclean animals and stuff and says don't call it anything unclean that the Lord has got, God has called clean and they carry the sheet back up to heaven. They believe that it's a, t a talit again. It's actually one of these. It's not just a bed sheet or something. It's a talit saying that the Lord, his talit is being dropped down showing that he has cleansed the earth with his blood because this happened after the resurrection. Anyway, uh, there you go. That's a messianic, uh, it doesn't say that in there, but we can infer no doubt the, the part with the, the woman touching the hem of his garment. That is what she is touching and that goes back, as I said, to Malachi 4. He will arise with healing in his wings and everybody in Israel would know what that means. You go to the book of Ruth, same thing. Spread the hem of your garment over me. Your authority, the edge of your garment, is being placed over me. I am placing myself under your authority. You see? And that's what it says. And I'll read you the account in case you haven't heard that before. But it's Ruth, probably chapter 3. Um, Samuel, right before Samuel, Judges, Ruth. Real teeny book. Book of Ruth. One of my, maybe my favorite book in the entire Bible. It says, um, uh, let's see here. She, oh, okay, stay, uh, where is it? Do, 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 do. Happened at midnight, she turned himself, and there was a woman lying at his feet, feet, and he said, Who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing. Same terminology as Malachi, for you are a close relative. Then he said, um, uh, anyway, so th that's what she's talking about, is that uh, uh, some uh, translations will say, put the edge of your garment over me or whatever, but it's the hem of the talit. That she's saying, put your authority over me. I'm submitting to you. Anyway, so that's, that's what we're talking about there. But the parallels are just uncanny in what's going on with Joseph and his brothers. And so now in 45.1, we are going to see Joseph reveal himself to his brothers. Go ahead, please. Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were too terrified to answer him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please, come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. Okay, now... I was listening one time to John Hagee. Anybody know him? Big fat guy down in Texas that just is... <sighs> anyway, I, uh, I, I shouldn't say fat about him, but I, I can't think of any other word that just fits that guy. His mouth, his attitude, everything is bloated. And what you know, he said that they couldn't believe that it was Joseph until he said, come near to me. And what he did, he told everybody to leave the room and he pulled down his pants and showed him that he was circumcised. And that's how they knew that he was a Hebrew and his brother. Where is that in here? Yeah, it, one, it's not in here. And they, uh, they uh, you know, maybe he got that some, from some rabbinic teaching. I don't know. But it was totally unnecessary. The guy spoke Hebrew. It's apparent he said that he spoke Hebrew. You know, but he pretended he didn't. He spoke Egyptian, but he understood them, so he did speak Hebrew. If he says he's Joseph and he takes off that thing on his head and he starts speaking to him in Hebrew, he doesn't need to pull down his pants and show him a circumcision. And secondly, people in Egypt got circumcised as well. That was, it wasn't just the Jewish people that did it. They did it at different times or different ages, but a lot of the surrounding people practiced circumcision. So that's an argument from silence. I mean, it's just, and it's a bad argument. It's not necessary to do that. But if you ever hear that commentary, I just disagree with it. I think that's, I, I don't think that's even necessary to bring that type of thing in here. And John Hagee is the same guy that goes out and baptizes people in the Holy Spirit. He says, anybody else been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and there are different baptisms, and please come up and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'll never forget the day, all these people in there, I've never been baptized in spirit. I, you know, like they got to do something, you know. They all go running down there and he stands there and goes, I'll baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is it. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You are marked with the Holy Spirit of God. Baptism is positional. Filling is power. Okay? Baptized is positional. It means the moment. It, what does it say? It says, um, I won't get into baptism again. I did that one time. But in Mark 16 where it says, uh, he who is, um, believes and is baptized is saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. 